Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Chris Stroop of Stroop Knives. Chris is an Army vet and entrepreneur who heads up a fast rising star in the camp and combat knife arena. His Stroop Knives is a North Carolina based family business that has expanded and seen many exciting developments in the past year. Uh, even winning a Best Of Award at this year's Blade Show West. We're going to talk about that. I have a personal bond with a Stroop knife, this TU2 with uh, my favorite maroon handle and logo etched in the bevel was a Christmas gift from my wife last year. It carries easily, cuts beautifully, and enjoys enjoys a tenured position in the old rotation. Uh, We'll find out what's new with Stroop knives, but first... Like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And uh, if you want to help support the show, quickest way to do that is to head over to uh, theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon and take a look at uh, what you can do over there and what you get in return. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Chris, welcome to the show. How you doing? Oh, you're a little muted there, but you'll come back up in a second. There I think. we go. Yeah. Did you unmute me yet? Yep. <laughs> How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Good. It's good to have you back on the show. I, I want to congratulate you on winning best non-knife tool at Blade Show West 2022. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, isn't it? That's pretty cool that we won an award at Blade Show. It's crazy. You're you're a pretty new company still and you won that award what is the best non-knife uh tool that you made tell uh, tell us about that we made a pry tool man of course i don't have one right next to me give me oh we were just talking about getting stuff together i forgot one right here sweet out right there in a stroop box yeah so this is the pry tool um it comes with a soft loop which will loop into one row of molly webbing So it takes up, if you put it on your kit, it takes up almost no room. And then it's a little pry tool. It's just a solid piece of 1095 high carbon steel that you can use instead of your knife. So if you want to bust open stuff or smash things, I don't know, whatever you want to do that you don't want to abuse the tip of your knife with. Yeah. And it fits in either way into the sheath. Oh, that thing, that thing looks great. Oh, I see. You don't have yeah. to worry about its orientation. That looks uh, great. It looks like you could use it as a screwdriver too. Uh, as yep. a pry bar, you could pop open, um, you could pry open uh, ca- um, uh, crates and stuff like that. Also, of course, I look at that and I think of, uh, you know, it's a, it also looks with that wedged tip. Uh, you could use it in a pinch to, to for pain compliance or whatever you want to call it, a weapon. Um but, you know, but but I'm looking over your shoulder, and there are so many other better options for that kind of thing. Um, but what 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 um, kind of inspired you to make a pry tool? I know you've been hot and heavy with uh, all all a number of different models of knives and tomahawks. Uh, what happened with the pry tool? How did this come to you? My friend Damien, uh, he's in Australia, and he said these are really popular there because guys can't carry knives. So they love carrying pry tools like this. And he didn't like any of the ones that were on the market. They were too expensive or flimsy or the design was just kind of weird. So he kind of guided me through what he liked and didn't like about all of them. He's a a paramedic and a firefighter, law enforcement, personal trainer, a lot of things. So he kind of helped with his experiences. And this is what we came up with. So in, in, in a way that skirts uh, a lot of their knife laws while giving the user like a, a whole bunch of utility uh, minus the slicing and, and, you know, some of the more obvious 
Uh, but if you needed to, you know, if you needed to use that for self-protection, no doubt you could. And there are so many other things you could use it for that you that you'll destroy your knife uh, using. That's that's pretty cool that it comes out of a, a real uh, need from someone that, you know. Yep. And we sent him the prototype. I think he got it about a week ago. Took a while to get there. So is there an issue? You mentioned he's a, a firefighter, and, and this is something that I've thought of before. Um, is there an issue with Kydex and uh, fire fighting? Because Kydex has a pretty low uh, melting point. And uh, if you're walking through a blazing house, would, would he be able to, would he have to have that in his kit inside somewhere? I don't think this would be the tool for being in active fire but maybe if they showed up to a scene of a car crash or something and he just needed to bust open the window or smaller tasks like that but if he was going into a building this probably isn't the tool for that probably yeah. more of an axe <laughs> i uh i said about to yeah i think you're right about that and that cool <laughs> that cool uh try tool thing that they have yeah. Um, I tried to design a knife at one point for a friend of mine who's a firefighter and I couldn't get around the Kydex problem. And then, and then he basically said the same thing you just said, like, well, chances are a knife isn't the first thing I'm going for. <laughs> you know, as I run, I'm like, are you sure? Cause I mean, you know, it's a knife. <laughs> so, uh, you, uh, have proto like you said you prototyped this uh, specialized tool with your friend in australia as i mentioned up front uh you served uh in the armed forces thank you for your service of course sir uh but do you tend to do that with a lot of your products send them out into the field with people that you know who will use them and put them through their paces uh in your r d yeah the craziest r d that i've found is my kids <laughs> <laughs> we're working on another knife with another company right now and i had the prototype done last week and we went out and made a fire this weekend me and the kids and they spent probably three hours just smashing pieces of wood with it over and over and over I, mean, I don't think any adult would abuse their knife that way but that's what i wanted them to do with it and i didn't even have to ask <laughs> Were they, uh, were they, yeah, instinctively just trying to, so were they batoning it and, and that kind of thing? Uh, you know, they were trying to make feather sticks, sort of, but it just turned into them hitting hardwood over and over on the side of it. <laughs> Man, uh, kids, yeah, they're, they actually are, you, you have boys, right? I have four boys and, or three boys and a little girl. Yeah, well, the little girls can tear it up too. I know mine do, but but I mean, little boys. If you wanna if you wanna set out to do a destruction test on something, yeah, you you're definitely want to go with them. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we started rolling. I am in a Bowie phase, and uh, so I've been using them to baton wood just to kind of check it out. And uh, this right here, this Tu two, seems like it would be a great option for a small knife uh, to do something. Uh, like that. So I got this knife uh, for for Christmas. It was a gift from my wife, and I uh, put put a little tweakage in it. Had my logo put on it. Thank you both, and all of that. Uh, but I, I've always kind of viewed it as like this um, as this carry, um, you know, weapon kind of knife. It it very much has that sort of. Uh, to me, it's a Viking kind of uh, sax style knife. That's what I think of it as. Uh, but I never think of it in terms of its outdoor utility because I'm not much of an outdoorsman, but just in this conversation so far, and just having this in hand while we're talking, uh, I'm, I'm feeling like this could really be an excellent all arounder. Tell me about, you know, what goes into these designs and what you're thinking of for, for your knives. Well, a lot of our design started with the mini and for a lot of for me it fits perfect because i'm a tiny little human <laughs> with not tiny but you know yeah. smaller than a lot so it fits in my hand perfect but for a lot of people it gets swallowed you know it's kind of back here so we made the tu2 is kind of like the big version of this and it's got a lot of utility yeah outdoors we've had people skin animals with it but a lot of guys will carry it concealed carry or on their kit or on their battle belt, law enforcement officers, all of those kinds of people. 
And then the way we design all of our grips is so it, whee, that way backwards land. <laughs> so it's got all the grooves in it. So you can wear it with gloves and it's really easy to grab out of its sheath and to retain, especially if it's wet out or in pretty much any circumstance. And they're designed to lock into your hand here so that we have a nice solid grip for whatever you're doing with it. So you, you have the, the whole uh, grip production uh, of it uh, autom uh, automated, I should say. Uh, at least last time we spoke, that uh, last time we spoke, that was a part of the process that you were working on, um, more or less automating, I should say, having having the grooves and such milled out. Um, and uh, so, tell me a little bit about what goes into building these. So we do see and see the handles, just. Uh the ridges and it's oversized so it'll be just a little bit bigger so every one of these gets ground exactly to that knife and then we round over all of the edges that way there's no hot spots and everything is nice and smooth and that makes every one of them unique so we don't just see and see the handles and then screw them on there's a lot more that goes into it after that and i've been learning over the last i don't know year or two how to run the cnc machine i have no machine shop experience i just bought a cnc machine and went for it and we're getting there. Yeah. And, and so what about the blades? How do you make the blades? We get the steel water jet cut. So it comes as a knife shaped rusty piece of steel from New Jersey Steel Baron. Okay. So that's made, you know, it's cut out in the United States, not too far from us. Every one of our designs, I designed the CAD file and then they cut it out and it just shows up as a rusty knife shaped thing. And then we just sharpen it and it's done. That's it. That's not it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people say to us when we go to some events. Oh, you just get it. You know, it's already a knife and you just sharpen it. Right, there's, 70, right. there's 75 steps that we painstakingly obsess over how to make each one of them better and better. Wow, 75. So, uh, you know, uh, part of uh, my introduction was labeling you an entrepreneur. Um, and that's that's uh, what, what you just mentioned, counting the steps and and um, maybe that's something that all knife makers do, and I just haven't uh, talked about that. But to me, that seems like something that really comes out of a business sense. Let's count how many steps uh, it takes to make this. Let's see if maybe we can reduce it by a step or two uh, without cutting corners. But let's see how we can make things more efficient so that we can spend more time making more knives. So we always want to make a better knife faster. Um, but we didn't count the steps because of that. We counted them because people always say, oh, all you do is sharpen it and then you're done. So to be able to counter that, we counted all of the steps. And that's not 75 like little steps. That's 75 processes. So some of those are multiple steps. Right. But we do obsess over every little part of the process and making it more efficient and better and repeatable. Uh, a lot, uh, you know, I know that you make these as rough, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say rough, but capable of doing rough, uh, rough and tumble work. Uh, and yet a lot of attention goes into the aesthetics of these. A lot of attention goes into your look. How would you describe your style? I don't want you to be scared to use this. So our style is kind of not abused already but it's got the rock tumbled finish so you're not going to be scared to pull this out and put it on your belt and carry it around and use it all the time because if you get a tiny scratch on here odds are you won't even notice because of the acid etched rock tumble finish and the way we texture the flats on the top so i hope that it encourages people to use it because i want it to be out there being used like a knife you know yeah well you know this uh this sort of uh rock pattern uh, that it gets um, mill or not milled, but um, what do you call it? Um, ground into the uh, flats of all of your blades uh, has definitely has a look, uh, but it also seems to have a purpose. Uh, and that is um, th what I've noticed is that it seems to reduce drag. Now, I don't know if that's just something that I'm fond of thinking. And so I think I feel that. But it seems like there's less because there's less surface area touching whatever you're cutting. Um, it also kind of cuts through things easier. Yeah, hundred percent on purpose. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. No, but an, another purpose of it is 
if you look close and it's kind of like brown or black colored, that's mm -hmm. forge scale and that prevents rust also. It's just another protection on the top oh, of it. Oh, yeah. So, so every now and then we get people that ask if it is rust, but it's the opposite. It's protecting the steel from the rust, but it just comes out different colors sometimes because every one of these is done by us. So sometimes you get color variations. And uh, it's 1095 blade steel that you use. Uh, why 1095? Uh, why not another carbon steel? Why are you fond of 1095? If we can abuse it and it yeah. keeps going. It's easy to sharpen. Everybody's heard of 1095. It's not some weird, obscure thing. Yeah. We know how to heat treat it inside and out because we've done it so many times now that we know exactly how to get the best out of it. It's just the old reliable. I think it's the king of carbon steels, personally. Uh, and, and you know, not that I have, you know, huge, vast experience testing uh, in scientific ways, but I, uh, I have a lot of 1095 blades, and the only knives I've ever made have been from 1095 or AEBL, um, you know, just kind of messing around uh, in the basement. And it, 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 I like it. I, something about it, well, I like that I can baton it through wood, too. Uh, totally unnecessary way to abuse my knives, uh, but it makes me feel like I'm using them uh, a little bit. So, um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit. So we covered a lot of that uh, when we spoke last time, um, but I wanted to catch some people up about your process. Uh, but some things that are new since last we spoke are some really exciting collaborations uh, that you've done uh, over this past year. I think you've had a very busy year, um, and. I saw you at Blade Show like six months ago at this point, uh, and uh, it was great to see you there. And that that was only half a year ago, and it seems like a lot has even happened since then. Uh, but you did uh, two collaborations, uh, and, and I want to talk about the first one, the Bravo 5. Okay. So who so, was this? Who did you collaborate with? And, and tell me about this thing. Okay. So the collaboration is with Justin Melnick. He's a, a police officer, canine handler, and he's also on the TV show SEAL Team as the dog handler, and the dogs in the show are his dogs. So here's the Bravo 5. If you're thinking it looks like the Mini, because it is the Mini. Oh, look, I got a gray Mini and a gray Bravo 5. Isn't that perfect? Oh, that's nice. But I sent Justin a bunch of knives because we decided we were going to do a knife together. And you kind of see the size comparison. Yeah. The TU2 was bigger than he wanted, and the Mini was smaller than he wanted. So these were born, or the Bravo 5 was kind of born of that. It seemed like a great fit, because this one it's, fits a lot more people's hands, and it's a little bit bigger, so you people feel more comfortable putting on their kit and taking it you know, on patrols, cops, and doing all kinds of things with. And and so Justin Melnick uh, and you, you you decided to do a knife together, and and this goes and the proceeds or some of the proceeds go to uh, one of his uh, a uh, tell me about the foundation that it goes to. It's the Special Operations Wounded Warriors. Okay. They do a lot to help veterans when they get out. They give they do a lot of events where they get veterans together and help them cope through some of the things they're going through. That's cool. So that's uh, that's a way that you can directly uh, give back uh, if you buy one of your knives. I mean, if you buy one of your knives, you're directly giving back to you, <laughs> who, who also <laughs> serve. But uh, no, I mean, if you want to help with this uh, special operations wounded warrior uh, program, you can get that uh, awesome looking Bravo Five. I can see, I can see what he means. I mean, this is a this is a great knife. This is on the uh, on the upper end of what I carry comfortably in the waistband in the three o'clock position. Um, and I, and I use the same discrete, uh, concepts clip and it rides, uh, nicely, but any bigger, it's too big. I could see how that Bravo five could be a, a great little daily companion. I mean, it's not little, it's a three and a half inch blade and that's, uh, that's bigger than what a lot of people prefer to carry in their folder. So, uh, as an EDC fixed blade, like perfect, I like, Perfect it's our spot. it's our best seller even outpaces the mini now oh the bravo five does oh yeah right on so uh another uh collaboration the mountain predator yep yeah okay so this this one is uh impressive in a different way uh this is not an edc 
knife as one <laughs> you know as one might uh, guess from the name mountain predator it is a oh look at all these as jim scrolls look at these knives sweet <laughs> uh okay so look at this beast so that's ej snyder's signature we laser engrave into each one so so if people don't know uh who is ej snyder E.J. Snyder is an outdoors survival expert and sort of celebrity or definitely celebrity. He's been on Naked and Afraid a bazillion times, I think six maybe. And he teaches a lot of outdoor survival classes. And he's E.J. is awesome. He's a character. and He's helped us in a lot of ways with our business, connecting What's... us with people and teaching us things. Wasn't he on that show with Cody Lundin, Dual Survival, for a short while? I don't know, maybe I think he was, and then he wanted to strangle him, and so <laughs> left the show. Uh, but uh, is the guy who walked around uh, the tundra with no shoes? Mm -hmm. And it, so he comes to you, or you go to him? How did this? How was this born? So one of the guys that used to work for us, Adam, they were Seer School instructors together. So Adam connected us, sort of, and I think maybe our email went to the junk mail, and I just tagged EJ. I want to say maybe December 23rd in a random picture that I posted and he responded and I invited him over and on Christmas Eve, he came over and spent probably half the day with us hanging oh, out wow. in the shop. Yeah. And now we're friends and whenever he's in town, he comes over and hangs out in the shop. And that day we decided to design this knife together. It's got a similar blade shape as that TU2 you have. Mm -hmm just super sized and then a different handle with the his nickname is the skull crusher so we put a skull crusher on the end of it how did he get that nickname i have no idea i've heard the story I but i don't remember man that's a hell of a nickname you know <laughs> yeah Mine is bobby <laughs> uh no but uh so he decided like let's make something and he likes bowies i guess so I mean, this is a big, dramatic, and, and I call I call it a double peaked Bowie. I like Bowies that, that have the humps on top like that. Mm. Um, what is that? About a nine inch blade, nine and a half inch blade? I think it's right around nine and a half. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And about a quarter inch thick. It's in that classic Bowie uh, sort of form factor. Yep. Um, and it's, so that's a that's a big knife. So for survival, um, in your experience, you know, I know you have quite a bit of experience yourself. Uh, does the larger knife usually win out? Uh, you could do a lot more with it if you're setting up camp because you can chop things a lot better. So if you had to build a shelter, it's a lot easier to use this to get your everything together, you know, chopping off branches off of trees and delimbing things and prepping whatever you need because it's basically a small axe in its own right. Mm. It's got a handle and you can really get some swinging behind it with the weight it's got. So for me, this would be definitely something I'd consider bringing if I had to survive for a long time. So how did you guys settle on the design? Um, did, was, it, was there a back and forth or did it happen like in a lightning strike? Uh, we just drew kind of a rough concept on a piece of paper. And then I made five or six different designs in CAD and emailed them over to him. And then we made them all out of Kydex just so we can see the shape and hold them and play with them. Nice. And then we probably made two or three more after that. <laughs> and then we settled on this design. And so what what has it been like uh, with that collaboration? And uh, have you made them all? Uh, is it a limited run? How are they all sold out? Tell, tell people how they can. We keep these available on our website. We normally We normally have them in stock. It may or may not be used in a TV show really soon. So we're trying to make some extras and have them available on the site. Oh, cool. So uh, you'll let us know, I hope, uh, if it is used on a TV show, and and uh, we'll spread the word and make sure people see it. Awesome, uh, yeah, for sure. That would be really cool. So if if they do that, do, like a movie company, do they have to come to you and tell you, or a TV production company? Or do they just use it, and one day you see your knife uh, in a in a TV show? So far, I've known about all the ones that have happened because Justin carries it on the SEAL Team TV show, the Bravo Five. Oh, cool. 
And then the other one, we sent the guy the knife for it. So he asked us if, you know, if he could buy one to use. We're like, no, but I'll send you one. <laughs> so these collaborations, do you get, uh, what, what do you get out of them as a, as a knife maker? I mean, I get, I get what you get out of it. Uh, as a businessman, you get someone else to share, sh share ideas with and, and, uh, you know, you can, you can share their name and they can share your name to, to, to promote a product. But, um, just in terms of, uh, you as a, someone who's learning more and more about knives and, uh, you know, designing and making, what, what do you learn from these collaborations? There's always something new to learn. So with this mountain predator, how do we make this giant knife over and over a bunch of them? repeatably with the same high quality so there's always a new thing and there's always a new marketing thing we learn which is a whole nother monster of owning a business that's kind of annoying but also interesting and fun and i just like working with other people on it because they don't make knives so now they get to have a knife with their name on it that they had design input and they get to be a part of that whole process so to me it's fun when justin says hey why don't we do a knife together? Heck yeah, let's make a knife together. What do you want it to be? Because your name's going to be on it too. So I want some of your input into this thing. And then he's all excited because we made this knife with his input. And I'm excited because we got to make it with somebody else's input. And they're excited. It's just fun all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. And he ends up getting a tool that's, uh, you know, made for his purposes and to, and to his um you know aesthetic who are the who are the other um uh knife makers out there whose designs you admire that that uh you know that you think kind of have a similar vibe definitely daniel winkler winkler knives he's obviously like the original this thing he's been doing it forever now and there's a lot that I've learned from him. He's become a friend over the years now. And then Spartan Blades, they're about an hour from us. Um, when I first, not first started making knives, but when I was able to make a decent knife, I came to them and hung out for a couple hours in their shop. That was two years ago, maybe three years ago. I don't know, a while ago. And ever since then, they've just helped us with everything. I talk to them all the time. We had dinner a couple weeks ago in Nashville together. They made my... <laughs> They made a little graphic with my logo and my face under it. Now it's the background on my phone. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Those it's awesome working with other knife makers. The whole knife community is amazing. And those are two, I mean, I mean, two two of the most respected outfits, you know, in the knife world. And it and you're close to what, both of them? You're because you're in North Carolina, right? Yeah, Winkler's probably four hours away. Okay. Well, uh, I, I am grateful to you for introducing me to him at Blade Show because I had an opportunity to talk, to talk to him on this show. And it was it was so cool for me because uh, I just, you know, I've, I've admired his work from afar. I've, I don't know any of his knives and and uh, I've seen and, and heard him, but never spoke directly with him. And, and it was a real pleasure. He's such a nice guy and so smart you know, seem to just have like a, a lot of, uh, you know, depth of knowledge about this stuff. Yeah. He's awesome. He's always pushing us to do better. And we always hang out at the shows and sometimes I email him and call him if I have questions and things I'm trying to sort through. That's what's so cool is the knife, other knife makers. We don't see each other as competitors. We're all trying to help each other do better. Yeah. That, well, that's funny. Cause I was going to ask you, um, because and this is kind of a rough question to ask but who who are your competitors like who would you consider uh your you know people in your uh, on the same shelf so to speak or is that is that a difficult question to answer that's a difficult question because there's our knives and the way we do it and our, kind of our story is so much different than everybody else's in a way we're similar to winkler because his are sort of you know he does a lot of it by hand still and they look similar with the acid etched and the or whatever kind of dark coating he puts on there and the similarities and a lot of times in knife stores or gun stores even we end up on the same shelf as him but it's hard to put us in the same thing we're not priced the same they're different materials generally 
similar uses, but also a lot of differences between the designs and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, uh, just speaking about Winkler, uh, knives for a second. Uh, I, I absolutely love them and, and the Tomahawks. Um, but, uh, and this is not even a, a, but, but, uh, just incidentally, this, I can carry the, the on my person on a daily basis in my suburban lifestyle. Whereas his knives are a little bit too, uh, too much for, for me to be able to carry around. So it would definitely be a collector only item for me. That's why I have yet to get one, but I would really like to, it's on my list. Uh, but I'd like to get one of his tomahawks first. Um, I gotta say his tomahawks are awesome, especially the Sayak. That's the one I'm the biggest fan of. Um, yeah. And over your shoulder, I see a bearded tomahawk and then I see a spike tomahawk. Uh, those are those regular models, uh, for you. Do you make those all the time? We try and keep them on our website, but normally they sell so fast as soon as we put them on there, I can't keep them in stock. So right now I have a couple in a box sitting over here for an event we're doing this weekend and we i'm gonna hope to put them on the website next week but we can't normally if i put 10 or 15 of them on the website they're gone within a day or two so we try and make them enough to keep up and we got hit hard with retail orders so i'm, I'm sure if you googled the tomahawks you'd be able to find them at a few of our retailers uh, that's pretty cool that you've expanded uh, to to various retailers since last we spoke. Um, but uh, before we talk about that, uh, with these tomahawks, uh, was there a call for them, or is this something that you just love and you just wanted to make? I don't remember. I started. I made the first two years ago, and only made a couple of them. Yeah, I think people were asking for them regularly. So then we'd make them kind of onesies and twosies for people, especially guys getting married or for going away gifts we would do them for and then every time we would make them six more people would ask for them and then more people so we increased our capacity to make them and got better and better at all the details of each one of them the sheaths took a long time to get right too yes i i, I would <laughs> imagine i would imagine i have a uh on loan um i have a very cool axe like tomahawk battle axe type thing from a from a big name, um, not not a big company, but a big name, and um, I, I won't mention him. Uh, but the sheath, I'm like, man, it looks cool. It looks like it should work, but tomahawk sheaths are tough. It's um, really tough. Yeah, yeah, I could see how, especially if you have any like a beard uh, on the blade or any sort of. I mean, this thing has a crazy looking blade and and a spike on the back, so. <laughs> you know i could see how it would be difficult in the first place but i think a beard uh like probably the norse axe behind you uh probably presents an issue with that um yeah that uh, one's not too bad the spike one is way harder to get right because you have to maneuver the little hook into the sheath and then get the spike to lock in there oh i see whereas the other one is more of just a straight uh you yeah, could sort of fit something straight onto that. So uh, the the reason I was asking is there a demand? It, it seems like it's not only a very popular item for people like me who collect, who are collectors, but but f the reason they became popular in the first place is because they were being used uh, by the service uh, overseas in combat zones uh, for opening door breaching and all sorts of stuff and and combat. Um, so I was curious if. Uh, the the people that you worked with in those days were requesting that kind of thing. Some of them, it's the guys that I worked with. We like to travel light, so you know I would never do army things with a big old tomahawk on me. But <laughs> I definitely keep one in the car in case we got stranded somewhere for the night, or right. you know, a lot of bad things happen in your vehicle. So having something big like that near you would be handy. Definitely, yeah. A lot of our friends are on still active duty and buy them for deployments i see what you're saying though but but like it's a pretty heavy piece of kit for being light and nimble for whatever you're doing yeah interesting yeah because uh those of us who uh well i shouldn't sit i shouldn't speak for anyone other than myself you know as as uh as someone who um has no combat experience yet has a love of all these kind of weapons it's like 
no, no, you can't be out there all laden down with swords and gear just because you think it's cool. And it, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but the tomahawk thing, uh, with, with RJ, uh, with, um, RJ, RMJ. RMJ, I was about to say RJ Martin with RMJ, uh, and, and, and earlier than that, and with the Vietnam tomahawk, with the American tomahawk company, it always seemed to, to have some sort of use in service, uh, in, in the American uh, military. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. Tomahawks just look cool, but they do have a lot of uses. Our kids love using them out in the woods in our yard. Just so for doing test. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. No, they just like smashing things with things. Huh. <laughs> well, that's good. So the, the family aspect of your business, how, how has that uh, helped you grow? And like, what, what about working with the family uh, do you love? Well, the biggest impact is my wife gets to work in the business full time too. So I get to work with my wife and every time we travel, we get to do it together. So that's super cool, that especially cool. after being in the army and never being home. And now I get to wherever I travel for work, my wife gets to come with me. And a lot of times if it's local events, our kids get to come too and help out the kids during COVID. They helped a lot because they weren't in school. But now that they're back in school, it's pretty hectic for them. They don't get off the school bus till four o'clock. And I finish working about four thirty or five every day or four if I can when they get off the bus. So sometimes they'll stand here and help me with things, especially if I bug them to or on the weekends they'll want, especially if they want to earn money. <laughs> no. Cool. Because we pay them to help. But we're trying to teach them even outside of the knife making, just how to run the business, kind of the decisions we make and how to deal with all of the things that are involved with the growing business. So it's fun to teach them as we go. Like I just got approved for a business loan maybe two hours ago to help build this second building we're building. And I walked them through why we decided to get a loan now. Cause up until now we've had no debt. It's all been funded just through, you know, keeping the money in the business. But I walked them through all the reasons we got the business loan and why we didn't take it out earlier and all the risks and the benefits and they're understanding it and kind of helping sometimes I ask them, what should we do <laughs> just to get them to think? Yeah. So that way they can either take over the knife business or they can start their own or they can help somebody in their business. That's pretty cool. I mean, I, I like the way, uh, well, I, I, I speak to a lot of people who work in the family business dynamic and it's interesting to see, different ways, different kids of different ages uh, can be involved. Everything from like building boxes and uh, to, to learning the, the trade. Uh, but, but I know from our previous conversation before you were doing knife making, uh, you were doing, I believe it was real estate, right? So you, you, you got, you got a business sense in an abstract sense in a, in a totally unrelated business that you are no longer doing, or I, I'm presuming that, uh, um, but you got the abstract uh, lessons in business from that and from probably other ventures in your past that you can apply to knife making, which is, of course, the best of all businesses. But you can also instill them through your kid uh, to your kids. I learned a lot of the backside boring stuff through real estate systems and mm -hmm. customer relations and following up and email and all that stuff that's not knife making. I learned a lot of in real estate. So it was definitely helpful, but real estate wasn't that fun for me. It just kind of steals your soul. <laughs> You're always on call. Yeah, no right, right, right. Always. And it just got too much for me. I sold a lot of houses and it helped fund our knife business. So I'm thankful for it. But it was time to move on to something less stressful. Wow. Owning your own business, making knives is less stressful. That's that's <laughs> that means you're doing something right. Um yeah, that's uh, 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 what was I going to say? Oh, oh, but with the real estate, with I'm of course thinking of my own job too. Like there are certain certain things uh, that are just good habits that you develop that you're forced to develop just to get by in certain jobs that you might not that might not be the pinnacle of your calling. Uh, but they teach you a lot along the way. They're so valuable. I've had so many of those, you know, in my years. Like. Uh, you know, learning different skills that have in aggregate really helped out. In real estate, they tell you to tell everybody what you're doing. 
right? So tell everybody you're a real estate agent. So that way, if they need to buy a house or sell a house or their friend, they think of you. So it's kind of like that, I guess, with everything is just networking, making friends, talking to people about what you're doing with knives. I mean, our whole, pretty much our whole life now is knives. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. Yeah. And that, and that networking thing is no joke. You know, I, I saw you at blade show, uh, you know, like a, like a phantom here and there and talking to people <laughs> and moving around, you know, that's, that's important. And, and, and I was a part of that and I'm grateful. Oh, Hey Bob, how you doing? Can I introduce you to anyone? Yes. As a matter of <laughs> fact, you can introduce me to Daniel Winkler. Sure. And then five minutes you're off, Daniel's off. And, and it was cool to watch you, uh, you know, moving, and operating like that um you know how much how much of that is uh, are you doing now that you're going to these shows all of it <laughs> all of it so i'm an extreme introvert and i would rather live in the woods and make knives by myself all day mm -hmm. but i'm really good at making friends and helping people with things and solving problems and you know connecting and having fun collaborating on projects so yeah, those events, I just kind of wander and make friends with everybody. Just... Th that sounds like an extreme extrovert. Everything you, everything you described <sighs> does not, no, but I, I get it. I get it. Uh, you know, yin and yang. Yeah, and then I go home and I sleep for a week. So, <laughs> right, right. So uh, where you are, um, where your shop is, is this uh, where you're going to be built? Tell me about this build out you're going to do, or, or is it a totally new space? Tell me about the expansion of the company. We're in a building right now that's about 2,000 square feet on my property, and we're adding a second building that's uh, 1,500 square feet, 30 by 50. The foundation was poured a week or two ago, and the building goes up on Monday the 12th. Wow, man. And that we just got the business exciting. loan, so we can insulate it, sheetrock, HVAC, electrical. Hopefully, six weeks from now, we have... A mostly functional shop with lights and walls and so can you maintain um uh full production uh in the current shop while all of this is happening uh or how does that work i yeah we're gonna build it out and get all the benches built at least room by room and then move everything probably nights and weekends so we don't have to stop at what we're doing because there's just too much to do to shut down so I think we're going to have everything wired and prepped and benches made. So that way all we have to do is just reshuffle equipment around. So what, uh, I don't know if this is a personal question or, you know, like uncouth, but how many knives do you guys make a month? Like what's, what's your, uh, because I know you're, I know I see you at uh, blade HQ and where have, else have I seen? I saw you at DLT, I think DLT trading recently. No, not yet. Uh, I was somewhere other than Blade HQ, and I saw you. Maybe it was Knife Center. Knife Center, Smoky Mountain Knife Works, e Knives. Okay, all the places I go and lurk. Yeah, uh, I, I've I've seen you, and I've especially seen the dagger, man. Uh, I, I don't mean to get off track. The dagger is awesome, <laughs> but uh, we can talk about that later. Um, uh, just in terms of demand now, now you have a number of retailers that you have to keep stocked, and then you have to keep your website stocked and and all of that how you know how much let's say in the past year or so since we've spoken how much has your production ramped up dramatically we've made uh right about three thousand knives so far this year wow and we had some slow months when we were building the shop because we moved in here in june of last year so a lot of this year was spent revamping the shop, closing in the screened in porch and insulating walls and building doors and adding walls where there was just openings to the outside. So a few of the months were pretty slow for production numbers, but we needed to, to just increase our production. So I'm curious to see how far we can push it with the new building. And uh, a lot of what we've been doing too is getting our employees all on the same page, which took employees as a whole a whole thing that has been a struggle for a while but we fired three people in the last six weeks maybe four weeks wow. and gotten a really good team that everybody meshes well and knows their roles and it's taken a long time for me to figure out 
who goes where, who's good at what, and what do they like doing. But I think now we're finally in a really good spot to really just turn the screws and start cranking out knives. Now we've got our systems flushed out and everybody gets along. There's no drama anymore. Okay. It's just <laughs> relax and make knives. Well, that that's kind of what I was going to ask. Um, is it Was it a personnel issue or were you having trouble you know, having people make your product because you want your product to be just so and it wasn't just so? At first, it was really hard for me to let people do things that weren't just, you know, clean the back of this handle or things like that. But we were up to 11 employees, 10 or 11 employees, and now we're at eight. So everybody that's here now is well-trained in what they do. And some of them are more detail-oriented than I am. So we have one guy who's a retired 82nd Airborne Sergeant Major, and he is very Sergeant Major, like with uh, the details of every little thing. So he does all of our final inspections now. And he, <laughs> That's he's cool. not a he's not afraid to kick back half of them <laughs> <laughs> and make everybody do their parts to fix everything. So it's just finding the right people and getting them in the right places and figuring out what they're good at, and they have to like doing it. I realize that also. <laughs> yeah is everyone in your shop a knife guy or gal is everyone there a knife nut i would say we have one. Oh, really so yeah. so the people who come to work in a knife shop who aren't knife nuts are machinists or people who otherwise would be doing something like that but maybe not knives i would love to have a machinist so i can have somebody else run the cnc machine <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of our guys are like retired law enforcement or retired military. I like to call them house dads, which is perfect because they're not here for the paycheck. They're here to belong to something. And they're the ones that take the most pride in what they're doing and our team and the family and everything we're doing. So those people are amazing. But then we have one guy. He came here one day to get a Spartan Blades pocket knife sharpened and then never left. <laughs> <laughs> now he, awesome. he works more hours than anybody else he offered to help us like hey i'm gonna come in tomorrow and just help you guys because i'm off work about halfway through that day the employees were coming up to me saying hey we gotta hire this guy because he's awesome so we hired him that day <laughs> you know they talk about corporate culture and and you know there's a lot of but that is the kind of culture you want to build in a workplace. You know, people, I, I love this idea of house dads, you know, these guys who are just, uh, who are probably all good with their hands, obviously, but, but they're all uh, retired from former high stress jobs. And now they just get to hang out, you know, around machines and other men uh, and other people. Cause I know it's not all just men, but, uh, and make knives that, that is a, seems like a very, great atmosphere you know and and probably the opposite of drama as you were talking about we had we had some struggles but we're learning how to i don't know going from the army to running a business is a big change and employees is just something i never had to really deal with in the army you don't get to pick and choose your employees you just that's what you have right so it's kind of a weird, I was listening to a business podcast about veterans and how they struggle with firing people because they're not used to being able to get rid of people. Like I can kind of see that you mentor them and mentor them and mentor them. And that's kind of what we did at the detriment of everybody's sanity for a couple of the people that were here. Cause there's, you can only ask somebody so many times the same thing, you know? Hmm. Like, that's interesting. Hey, go ahead. No, go, no, no. You go ahead, please. Or people like, hey, I'm going to be at work tomorrow morning. Okay, I'm counting on you to be here. And then they call you 10 minutes after they're supposed to be here. Oh, I'm not going to be there today. How many times did you put up with that? Or, you know, hey, when you acid etch this knife, if it has a big weird white spot on it, you got to go through these steps again. You can't just put it on the table at the next process. You got to go back and fix it. Like, how many times do you have to nicely talk to them about that before, some, you know, like, hey, I've we've done this 30 times now and somebody else has to go and do it a second time. So now I'm paying hourly wages twice for the same process, but I have all the patients in the world and I'm trying. My instinct is to just keep helping, you know, let's keep yeah. working on it. But how many times do you let them make the same mistake before? So that's where the other guys in the shop are like, Hey, look, man, 
your business is losing money because of these yeah. people. So it's finding the right people to help me make those hard decisions, I think. Yeah, and who can encourage you and help you. Um, uh, the flip side of that that I've seen are uh, people who have served, who who put up with bad situations, say, at work for longer than they should because they're used to just kind of putting up with it due to rank or whatever whatever their situation is in the military uh but it's like no but you, you don't have to do that anymore you're you know you're not a part of that you know and and yeah so that's that's an interesting uh so i don't want anybody to feel like that here i want everybody to show up and man this is awesome everybody's just making knives and working together and it's a place they can come and tell war stories and you know like oh i had this crazy private that did all these crazy things and they're all hanging out laughing on their breaks and you know, makes them feel like they're part of the team and it's cool. Uh, so do they come with you to the shows? Uh, do they, uh, or I know that this is kind of a relatively new team at this point, but, uh, is this a group that you plan on, you know, kind of bringing with you when you go to the shows and that kind of thing? Like your, your dyed in the wool crew. We bring a couple with us. Some of the guys don't want to have anything to do with going to these shows. Mm hmm. Or they've determined that they're never going to work on the weekend again. And all the shows are on the weekend. So just because of that, they're like, nope, I'm not coming no matter what. <laughs> and then some of the people, it's all sales and business things. So it's a balance of finding who's good at selling knives and who wants to do it. And we've learned that you need to have a knife maker looking dude, like a, you know, a grown up. And then you can have somebody else. Cause one of our employees is 19, Gabe. And then Sarah is 22 and we've had them at a booth before and they can't sell knives. It's people, it's just the, they're knowledgeable, they work and then they're the ones that make the knives, but it's that maybe trust or that confidence of, you know, yeah. a dude with a beard. So if we have Gabe and a dude with a beard, <laughs> cause most of the, most of the guys here have look similar to me, you know? Yeah. So if you have that combo and it doesn't matter, it's just the appearances of it then we sell way more knives and more people approach us and talk to us yeah i mean it's there's weird. nothing well think of it if you're at a a makeup convention you know would you buy the makeup from the guy that looked like you or from you know the <laughs> the the good looking lady you know yeah it's, it's the same thing <laughs> it's a valid point but it took me a little while to realize that when they were there we didn't sell hardly any knives and nobody talked to them you know it's because they want to talk to a knife maker <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> with dirty hands you know and yeah and so uh, what what kind of projects i know you can't reveal much about things that have not come to pass yet but what kind of projects we know you do fixed blades and and tomahawks and now pry tools which are award-winning which is awesome again congratulations but what other kind of projects are you looking to to take on in in the offing so we just did a podcast with black rifle coffee and it comes out on December 12th. This is airing on the 11th. So tomorrow, if you're listening to it the day this comes out, I think that's going to be pretty big. And then oh, yeah. we're, we're doing a bushcraft style knife, which was one of those collaborations that I learned a lot of different skills on because it's a whole different handle design and a different steel thickness and just a different use. So that's going to also come out on the 12th of December um that's going to be released here in december and that'll be a short run only available a limited number at least for this first batch uh so that's going to be really cool that's a completely different style from anything we've done yeah is is that also a, a collaboration with someone yeah a uh, company okay oh company okay so you, yeah. yet to yet to be released uh information but uh so i, I and and I don't need any uh, corroboration, but I'm imagining something like a Kephart or a, uh, you know, some like a Canadian belt knife or something uh, that would I, actually a Kephart, I think, would fit your style. Um, but th that's just me. So I'm I'm going on record saying that, but I look forward to seeing it, what it looks like. And I bet the grind has to be different, too. Right. Like you have to look at it a different way. Yep. Lots of experimenting that went into this in a very short period of time. Interesting. I and designed. So, good. I, I I was gonna say, did you did you end up going to, taking prototypes out back and using your um, you know the skills you learned in the military to 
to test these things? Yeah, definitely. And to let my kids just abuse it to see what it's going to hold up to. <laughs> it held up well. They smashed it into cinder blocks on accident a few times. Oh, there was just man. the tiniest little nick in the blade. But so I, I interrupted you. You were about to say, I designed. Oh, I designed the handle in a hotel room in Utah. And it took me way longer than it should have, but it worked on the first run. It was pretty cool. <laughs> really? So you were, uh, you just happened to remember that that, that was. Oh, it was a really short suspense from the time that we decided to do this till the time I had to have prototypes done and in the mail. <laughs> oh, so wow. the only way to make this work was to design it while I was in Utah recording that Black Rifle Coffee podcast. Oh, that is cool. That must have been really fun. It was. It was a little nerve wracking. I'm like, this is a big deal. And a lot yeah. of people are going to hear this. That comes out soon. So I'm curious to see what comes of that. It was fun, too. Mike Glover was a good host. Uh, I, I've seen some of their content on YouTube, uh, some of the older stuff uh, they did, kind of like skits and stuff. And man, they were very good and hilarious. And their coffee is just awesome. I don't yeah. even drink coffee. You, yeah, that's that's surprising to me. I thought all all uh, army, I thought all military guys were were coffee drinkers, but I guess not. I don't drink alcohol either, so I don't fit the normal. I, I don't fit the normal of anything ever, so it's just normal for me to not fit the normal. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I remember uh, recently seeing you pulling some weighted sled uh, through the woods, and I was like, this this is a man who's in shape, and he's, uh, <laughs> you know, he's got a vision. He's got a vision. What? Well, what do you what do you see for Stroop knives? Like, what what is the ultimate goal here? What do you want to see Stroop knives be? when you're ready to hand over the reins. I want us to be a household name, maybe not as big as Benchmade, but up there with Winkler and Spartan Blades and beyond and just see how far and big we can grow it and how many people's lives we can impact. So right now we have eight employees. So that's eight people that I get to provide for their family and their lifestyle and provide them a safe, healthy work environment where they get to, you know, a lot of them are veterans in law enforcement and they're working through their, their things going on in their brain. So they get to come here and learn a skill and make knives and kind of help quiet all that down. So, and then those things that they're making are going out into the world, into the hands. Yes. Into some hands like mine who, who, you know, don't, whose life doesn't rely on them, hopefully ever. Uh, but also uh, they're going into the hands of people uh, for whom they, they could make all of the difference. And that, that's got to mean something. That's got to feel like something for, for them and for you. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And it's cool when we make something and ship it across the world, too. We shipped a pry tool to Sweden the other day. Oh, cool. So the guy was like, man, I know that I helped make a pry tool that's going all the way to Sweden to be used. Yeah, no kidding. So what, what do you hear back from the field? What do you hear back from users uh, who have your knives? I made an Instagram post about this today, actually. Um, when I was still making knives in a one-car garage by myself with two, three years ago, a guy came by to buy a backpack I was selling and ended up buying a knife that I had made. And he sent me a picture of it. The scales are like half destroyed somehow. And he reprofiled the tip because he said he was a 50 cal machine gun was jammed and he used it to pry open the bolt. <laughs> Whoa. But he said he has absolutely abused it and done things that no knife should ever hold up to. He's like, I still carry this thing every day. And it's amazing. That so, is the best. <laughs> yeah. And he cared enough to reach out and say that it's still holding up and sent me some pictures. That's the coolest thing in the world to me. That is. And no doubt as the years go by uh, and, you know, this is you're still a young company as the years go by and you're at more and more shows, there are going to be more and more people walking up to you. Oh, let me show you my TU2. I've carried this every day since I bought it. And yeah, that that's got to feel great. That's got to feel really great because it's not just something that you're making that's going to hang on someone's wall that they appreciate. And there's, I, I'm not saying that that's not a, a, you know, great thing to do to make art like that. But you're also, you know, you're making a tool. You're making a tool that people get to bond with, but they also get to rely on. And, uh, you know, knowing that you're doing that's got to feel great. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's cool when people buy our knives as gifts to their friends too, especially military members and or retirement gifts and they buy a tomahawk and we engrave the the unit logo on there and they put it on a plaque 
that's really cool to me too that people like our stuff that much if they want yeah. to gift it to somebody well yeah this is the perfect time to do that <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> uh chris thank you so much for coming back on the knife junkie podcast it's been a real pleasure talking with you again thanks for having me this is always fun i'm sure we'll do it again next year uh indeed sir <laughs> all right take care thanks you as well There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Stroop of Stroop Knives. Uh, I just love the image he painted of the house dads um, all all around his shop, making his awesome knives and and just being together. And and I don't know, sounds like a really really cool retirement atmosphere. So maybe uh, maybe we'll have to look uh, to move to New, uh, I was gonna say New York, New. I mean North Carolina uh, someday in the in the future. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for joining me and this interview with Chris Stroop. Uh, join us again next Sunday for another great interview with another great personality from the knife world and uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday night knives. Uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.